All right, uh, let's open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians. We're going to be uh, going through the first four chapters this Sunday, so we're going to look at uh, the end of chapter 4 tonight. Chapter 4, starting in verse 16. He says, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And Lord, we pray uh, for help that you would encourage us and teach us, Lord, how to... uh, not lose heart, how to look not at the things that are perishing uh, or temporary, but look at the things that are lasting and eternal. Help us, Lord. We, we pray that you'd help us to understand uh, our circumstances and recognize how you're working in, in our circumstances so that we could have that hope that comes from the Spirit, that we would abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so our part in that, Lord, help us. Help us to do our part. Help us to understand it. Help us to put it into practice. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, I'm always uh, amazed at the Bible in that it says things that are really, I don't use the word crazy, but out of this world or, or over the top. And then it, the writers say them as just so matter-of-factly and so simply and, so, and just so plain. Uh, Paul says, we're not looking at the things that you can see, but we're looking at things that are not seen. As though that would be something that, you know, like, oh, yeah, of course, that's what we do. Um, if you are in public and you're looking at things and you're the only person who can see them, probably someone might call the police or they might be worried about your welfare because you're seeing something that nobody else sees. Something's probably wrong with you if you're seeing something that nobody else sees. I mean, unless you're the first person who saw it, and you go, look, there's an airplane. And then someone looks, and they go, oh, yeah, there's an airplane. But if you're seeing something and nobody else is seeing it, um, that's usually some kind of sign that a person's either on, under the influence of some kind of drug or they've got something happening with their brain. They're, they're losing um, control of themselves or something. So... Paul's, Paul actually is saying the secret to not losing heart is to be able to do something like that. It's a, this is just a, a radical passage of Scripture. Um, he's talking in 2 Corinthians quite a bit about his circumstances. He's very open about the difficulties that he's been in. He's very honest with them. He describes in chapter 1 uh, that he doesn't want them to be ignorant of the trouble that they went through when they were in Asia. And he describes it. Uh, In verse 8, chapter 1, verse 8, he said, We don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble that came to us in Asia, which would be probably the area around Ephesus. He said that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. And then he describes it in verse 9 by saying, We had the sentence of death in ourselves, but the result that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Paul's using his own testimony, his own life experience in serving the Lord. So he wasn't outside the will of God. This isn't suffering that you bring on yourself because you were drunk driving and then you crashed into a parked car and your car was totaled and then your insurance company wouldn't cover it and now what are you going to do because you don't have a car and now you have this is your second DUI and you lost your job. Well, no, those are all trials you brought on yourself. Those are, those are the hardships of foolishness. Paul was doing what God told him to do. He's not doing anything wrong. He's actually obeying God. He's right in the middle of the will of God. And yet it brought him to this place in verse 8 that he says, burdened beyond measure. Now certainly Paul knows Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And yet the circumstances in Ephesus or in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, where they were ministering, brought him to the point where he says he was beyond strength, above strength. That wherever his strength was, The circumstances took him past that to the point where he said, I despaired of life. The circumstances were such that they started thinking, it'd be better, Lord, if the rapture happened. Now, haven't you thought that many times? You thought, Lord, 
I, I'm not going to take my life, but if you take my life, that's okay. You know, like, Lord, if you just snatch me up and take me like Enoch, just take me straight to heaven and get me out of the situation. Sometimes we go through things that are just so hard, and even Paul says we have the sentence of death on ourselves. He recognizes here, and, and then also in chapter 4 earlier, um, in verse, starting in verse 8, he said we're hard-pressed on every side, the same, same chapter we're looking at tonight. Uh, but earlier, in verse 8, hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Describing it in verse 10 as always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. That doesn't really sound super pleasant to like well no if you're carrying your own cross and you're following Jesus and you say I'm crucified with Christ and I no longer live and the life that I now live in this body I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me so yes of course then death is going to be working in me because I'm carrying my cross I'm following Jesus and so hard pressed and perplexed and persecuted and knocked down and carrying about the dying of Jesus laying down his life but as long as that's happening, we have to look at the other side, not crushed, not despairing, not forsaken, and not destroyed, and caring about the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be manifested. One of the things that I think we really have to go to the Bible for to wash ourselves of our culture, and I don't know if it's, my experience is just contemporary cultures around the world, we have one of the worst in America, because we've got the idea in our country, it's very popular, it's very normal to think that nothing bad should happen to you, and if bad things are happening to you, they should stop, and God shouldn't allow them to happen, and you should, you should never be a degree too cold or a degree too hot, you, sh you should have everything that you want, and even um, the, the challenge in our country where even people who are in poverty there are people in poverty in the, in the U.S., and this isn't to say we shouldn't care for the poor, so please don't misunderstand. The Bible says to care for the poor, and uh, you can just assume that there's someone poorer than you that you're supposed to care for. That's the Bible's view of it. But if you go around the world, there's a lot of people that are poor in other countries that would love to come and be poor in our country. That is a really different experience to be poor in Mexico as opposed to being poor in California. To be poor in India is a very different experience than being poor in Sacramento County. So um, the, the culture that we're in, we're, we're so affluent and we're so comfortable that we could get the wrong idea that, that suffering isn't part of what it is to be a Christian. It actually is. It's a big part of it. Burdens, difficulties, things that will bring you to the end of yourself so that, like Paul said, so that we won't trust in ourselves, but we would trust in God who raises the dead. We had to get to the point where we were done with ourselves so that we could trust in God. In chapter 4, he says, we're delivered to death so that the life of Jesus could also be manifested in our bodies. For the life of Jesus to be clearly revealed, it, it almost always involves somebody suffering. If you want to manifest the life of Jesus, then you're going to have to choose to suffer. It's just the way it is. The world's broken, and God's mechanism for changing a broken world is to send his son to be the savior of the world, which means Jesus, though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might become rich. He didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So the mechanism for rescue is sacrifice, self-sacrifice. It overcomes the evil that's in the world. And so those of us who are alive, we're always delivered to death, he said in verse 11 there in chapter 4, that the life of Jesus will be manifested, verse 12, so then death is working in us, but life in you. Now, if you've ever taught Sunday school classes, you know that sometimes it feels like that. Maybe it felt like that at your job this week already, where you were laying down your life and you thought, well, death was working in me. And I hope that life was coming out somewhere else because I was suffering. And so when Paul says in verse 16, therefore we don't lose heart, we don't lose heart. The idea of losing heart, it's repeated. He said it also in verse 1. 
Therefore, since we've received this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. Starts the chapter with this phrase and then ends the chapter with the phrase, we do not lose heart. One of the messages he's wanting the Corinthians to grow in and understand one of the teachings and the, is, is not losing heart. Don't lose heart. And, and so to me, you have to ask the first question is, well, well and why? Why would, why would the Bible have to say not to lose heart? Now, this, this, you have to follow me for just a minute um, because it's, this is an interesting thing about this word, not losing heart. The Greek lexicon defines it as to lose one's motivation in continuing a desirable pattern of conduct or activity. To lose one's motivation in continuing a desirable pattern of activity or conduct. So um, inside of you is saying, this should be done. I know I should do this. This is the right thing to do. But your endeavor to do that, between that thing happening all the way and you starting, somewhere along the way you... You lose, you're losing energy, you're losing enthusiasm. That's their other definition. Lose enthusiasm or to become discouraged. Or secondary, it's used of people when they're afraid, and this would be in secular Greek, to be afraid in the face of a great difficulty. So the idea is this thing should be happening. I agree that it should be happening, and I'm endeavoring to do it, but on my way to do it, I was running out of gas. So why do we need to be told not to lose heart? Shouldn't this, the end result, like, listen, if you're raising kids, the end result of raising kids is that your kids are grown up and they love God and they're healthy and they can provide for themselves and they're happy and they're whole. Like, that's a great goal. That goal by itself should help you not lose heart. But all of us who are parents know that while that's true and it is helpful, it's not enough, <laughs> Right? Maybe you're a school teacher. Maybe you're working in some area, you know, and you're working with your hands. You work with a crew, and you think, I want these guys to know Jesus. I, you know, I want this team to know the Lord. I want, I want these people that, are, that I'm working with in my area, and, and we want to do a good job for the company. I want the, the end results are all really good, but then the end result, as good as it is, almost never is enough to get you to not ever feel like, man, I quit. Or actually quit. Just go, you know what? Later. <laughs> Later days, mayonnaise. I'm out of here. Like, I'm splitting. Why do we need to be told this? Well, because sometimes it doesn't look like what we're doing is working. <laughs> so we lose our enthusiasm. Uh, especially in ministry. Sometimes what we're doing doesn't look like it's working. Uh, I, I've seen this happen so, so many times. There's so much passion and idealism when the Lord's speaking to you and he starts to call you to something and you get so excited about it and you go, yeah, I can't believe they were going to let me do this. This is amazing. And, and you, you feel just so charged about it. And then you do it for three months and all the people that were part of the thing you were doing, the people that were going to do it with you, they all quit because they didn't like it. And then the people that you were trying to do it for, you found out they're just a bunch of complainers. And they don't really want to grow, and they're taking advantage of you, and everything you're doing is just going down the tubes. And it's only the third week, or you know, <laughs> but it happens. There's this, there's this like hit with reality where did the Lord tell me to do this or did he not tell me to do it? Because I've lost my enthusiasm. Because because why? Well, because it looks like the thing I was trying to do is not working. Or sometimes the thing that we are trying to do is actually really, really hard. Sometimes we're trying to bridge a gap that can't be bridged. Sometimes we're trying to take on a problem that people can't solve. If you think of Jesus, what was Jesus taking on? Talk about a hard job. All human beings who ever lived had sinned and separated themselves from God. And so Jesus came into the world to reconcile sinful men who had rejected God and run away from him and blasphemed him and Jesus came into the world to reconcile lost sinners to a holy God who loved them and wanted to save them. That's, not, that's pretty hard. So sometimes, because I'm talking in the context of 2 Corinthians, Paul's talking about trials that are ministry-related, Jesus-related, uh, in, in his desire to seek the Lord and follow the Lord, uh, and doing what he thought God was telling him to do, he repeats here twice. He gives them details of his own struggles, but repeats twice that 
here's how we don't lose heart. These, these are some of the things that we, we have that we do that, that will keep us from getting discouraged because I think the thing that we're trying to do is really hard. Do you know God wants every single Muslim on the planet to hear the gospel and understand it? To hear it in a way that is compelling and meaningful and clear in a language that they can understand? Now, whose responsibility is it to get the gospel to every single Muslim on the planet? That would be the church of Jesus in the last days. In this moment, that's our responsibility. I don't know what our particular, as individuals or us as a church, we can't do all of it, but certainly there's something we're supposed to do. If, if nothing else, but then pray. Certainly we should be concerned about that and praying for that. So that's a big deal. How about, how about this? God wants every single person in China to at least hear the gospel and have it presented to them clearly and in a way that they can understand, not, not surrounded with a bunch of cultural things, but, but just the gospel. Well, there's a government that's not really keen on people bringing the gospel to, to China. Or you could think of many, many other things. Uh, where you live, where you work, in your city, in your county. God doesn't want people sleeping on the streets, freezing in freezing cold weather. God doesn't want our city streets filled with trash and human waste and drama and chaos. God doesn't want, it, he doesn't want people so messed up on drugs and they're just completely lost their minds. God cares about every single person. But we can look at that and say, well, that's hard. That's a really, like, how are we going to do that? It's easy to lose your enthusiasm or to lose your heart or lose that, that, or become discouraged, lose your motivation, I think is how the dictionary definition said it, to lose your motivation in doing something that should be done and you know should be done, and maybe God even told you to do it, but man, when it's hard, it's hard. Or sometimes I think we lose heart, we lose our motivation because sometimes doing good creates more drama. And it creates more problems. Remember what happened to Moses when God called him and sent him to Egypt to go tell Pharaoh to let the people go? It did not get better. He had an, an amazing encounter with God where God reveals the name of God, I am that I am, which is going to directly point to Jesus. He sees a bush burning with fire, the voice of God speaking to him. He's recommissioned. This miracle happens with his staff and a serpent. Staff turns into a serpent. He goes to Egypt and he goes to the Pharaoh. God says, let my people go. And it gets worse. He's doing exactly what God told him to do. And it didn't get better. It got worse. Remember, the people were mad at him. Like, you know, remember the Pharaoh's more bricks, less straw. You know, like these people are just trying to get out of work. We're going to double their work. Can you imagine how terrible that would be? I can, because I've been involved in lots of ministries. <laughs> Listen, if you're gonna if you're gonna endeavor to do what God wants you to do, sometimes, not every time, but a lot of the time, when you step out into something, you're all enthusiastic and you think, all right, it's an open door and it's gonna flow. And yeah, it flows. It's you're going against the current, it's flowing. <laughs> so you jump out into the current to go against the current, you're going to realize logs are coming down the river. It's a giant flow. The course of the world is going along. There's all kinds of things that just wipe you out. And as long as you were going the same way as them, you know, you, they're a raft on the way to destruction. But you start going upstream, it's another matter. So uh, we do need to be told this. It's easy to have this happen. Certainly Paul describing his circumstances and putting it in the context of we were perplexed, but we weren't despairing. We were without a way out, but not without a way out. We were knocked down. I mean, that, we got, that circumstance happened and it knocked me flat, but I, I got back up. We were, we were hard pressed. We were being squeezed, but we weren't completely crushed. Now, the reason I wanted to say this is going to be a little bit lengthy sort of explanation about this word because this word is used several times in the New Testament. And I'm going to read all the verses quickly. We're not going to look at all of them, but I just want to read them. So you're, they're all in passages that are pretty familiar. You'll be able to remember them. But look how the word is used in the New Testament. Luke 18.1, Jesus spoke a parable to them that men ought always to pray and not lose heart. 
2 Corinthians 4.1, since we have this ministry, as we've received mercy, we don't lose heart. Our verse, verse four, six, chapter 4.16, therefore we don't lose heart. Though the outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Ephesians 3, 13, therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. And then 2 Thessalonians 3, 13, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. That's, that's where the word's used in the New Testament. That's why the dictionary defines it as Losing enthusiasm or um, your motivation in a desirable pattern. Because Jesus said you should pray and not lose heart. Well, prayer is good. But has anybody ever lost heart in prayer? Anybody ever prayed for something for a long time and then thought, you know, I'm not praying for it. I already did pray for it. If the Lord wants to answer those previous prayers, they're up there. I logged them. They're unanswered. They're sitting there on the books. Anytime he wants to open up the books, he'll see that there's a bunch of unanswered prayers. I've prayed this many times. We can lose heart in prayer, but we all all say prayer is good. Paul said we have this ministry, describing his ministry in chapter 4. His ministry of what? He's the apostle to the Gentiles. (laughs) So he's preaching the gospel. He's bringing the gospel to the lost world. He's, he's, uh, you know, so that God will shine his light in people. So that's a wonderful thing to keep doing. Uh, but it'd be easy to lose heart. He says uh, in Galatians 6, 9, don't grow weary while doing good. So doing good, well, what, that's any kind of good that you're doing. So he's already acknowledged this is something good. You've recognized that it's good, but it, you could grow weary. Um, the Ephesians passage, Ephesians three thirteen, I ask you that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. So He's a prisoner when he's writing to to the Ephesians. He'd suffered in Ephesus. That's what he's talking about in in chapter 1. The trouble we had in Asia is probably trouble he had in Ephesus. They had quite uh, an exciting time in the book of Acts, you know, in in Ephesus. And it seems like he he says in, I think, the last last Sunday night study, uh, wrestling with wild beasts in Ephesus, he had written to them. So, I mean, this is a difficult place. And so the people... In Ephesus, Paul said, don't be discouraged when you hear about my tribulations that were on your behalf. To bring the gospel to them, to, to minister to them, to plant the church there, to expand the ministry, you know, or whatever, whatever his role was. He didn't start the first church, but he was there for a long time, and the gospel went throughout the whole region. They suffered for it. And so he's telling the people in Ephesus it, it was a great thing, actually. So don't, don't lose heart when you hear about the trials that I'm having. The Thessalonians, of course, were going through trials as their church had been planted. He tells them, don't grow weary in doing good. So the idea is you've committed to doing something. It's the right thing to do. The Lord told you to do it. And you're losing your enthusiasm. You're losing your energy you're losing your motivation, you're becoming discouraged. And so Paul says, don't, don't become discouraged at this. Don't, don't lose heart. In verse 16, if we go back to the verses that we read, that we began with, he said, even though our outward man is perishing, this trouble that, he, that you could have, and he's expressing it in, in the terms of contrasting an outward and an inward, The outward man's perishing, but the inward man is being renewed day by day. That's part of how we don't lose heart. The inward man's being renewed, but the outward man, he's suffering. He he continues the contrast in verse 17. Our light affliction, which is for a moment. That's on one side. It's affliction, but it's just light, and it's just for a second. And it's working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. This one is light, but this one has an exceeding weight. This one is um, perishing. It's on the outside. This one is glorious. It's on the inside. It's eternal. This one's temporary. There's this idea that the trials that are happening are producing in us, as we're seeking to serve the Lord, and the difficulties come, the difficulties are producing something in us that's eternal. 
So difficulties, when they come into your life, they produce humility, they, they produce patience, they produce uh, a, an, an interest in slowing down and waiting on the Lord. If you, if you remember, if some of you guys that have been Christians for a long time, you can remember when you were a new Christian or a younger Christian and how you just didn't know how to be patient and you were around someone who was an older believer and they were just so patient and just, just at ease, like Jesus asleep in the boat. When he gets up, he's like, what are you, why are you so fearful? Peace be still. It's, you know, someone that knows the Lord and is walking with the Lord and has a relationship with the Lord for some period of time has this eternal weight of glory. There's some glorious thing from the Lord that's part of their life, and it's weighty. And the only way you get it is by having difficulties. That's why if you go back to the verse that we read, um, chapter 1, verse 9, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, but the result, that we should not trust in ourselves. You mean Paul was trusting in himself? Yeah. Yeah. Or he was in danger of it. And when did he realize that he was? When he got the sentence of death in himself. <laughs> and when he got the sentence of death in himself and he was despairing even of life and he was at the end, that's when he realized, oh, I think I've been putting way too much trust in myself or in my friends or in my team or in the resources that we had or in my knowledge that I've accumulated. I mean, the guy, think about somebody who could depend upon their own knowledge would be this guy. But he said, we have the sense of death in ourselves so that we wouldn't trust in ourselves, but what? We would trust in God who raises the dead, who delivered us, and look at verse 10, it's so wonderful, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver us, or does deliver us, I'm quoting the old King James, sorry. He delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust he will still deliver us. That doesn't sound like a person that's still under the sentence of death. Something happened between when he's, had the experience he's talking about and when he's writing this. He did deliver us. He will deliver us. He's going to always deliver us. I've, I've had the wonderful pleasure of having lots of amazing uh, people in my life as a Christian growing, growing in the Lord over, over the years. Wonderful mentors, godly older people who uh, they, they could be like Paul and say, God has delivered me. He is delivering me and he's going to deliver me always. And you need to have people like that in your life because sometimes you get the sentence of death in yourself and you come to the end of yourself and you start wondering, this is where I don't get delivered. This is where, no, this is where I get delivered, where they deliver me and they drop me off and like I'm delivered, you know, like kick them out, you know, out of the back of the truck and dunk, 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 dunk off the side of the road. I got delivered. So no, God's going to get me out of this. God's going to work. Again, remember, Paul's talking about his ministry. We've received this ministry the first time he used it in chapter 4 when he says we do not lose heart. He's talking about difficulties when we're trying to serve the Lord. One of the things that, especially uh, a person who's new to wanting to serve the Lord, uh, it's very difficult to overcome the initial difficulty when, you, when, you're, when you're just starting to serve the Lord and and it, it seems like the inertia, the amount of energy to get you from being stationary to be moving, it seems like, man, that's the biggest thing that ever happened as I was doing nothing. And now look at this. Well, God's totally, he gave me a heart for this and he opened the door for this. And let, you know, because normally in physics, getting something from at rest to motion requires this massive amount of energy. But my personal experience watching, uh, you know, yes, that's a big thing. But you know what? You need a lot more energy once the car's rolling because once, once you say, all right, I'm going to go for it, you start wanting to be used by the Lord, the circumstances will happen to discourage you and they happen quick and it comes in succession like wave after wave after wave and it, will, it can wear you out. Whereas you can handle one, you can handle two, you can handle three, but the fourth one you start to go, man, why did I even sign up for this? And then the fifth one just mows you down. And, and then the sixth and the seventh. It can, be, it can be challenging. But Paul says those things that are happening, really, in, in this comparison, they're light. And they're just for a moment. You see, the discouragements, the attack of the enemy, 
they don't last forever. Uh, let, me, let me put it to you like this. When I was, um, first went to college, my, the church I was attending gave a wonderful scholarship for uh, the young men that wanted to go in the ministry. You, worked, you did some ministry at the church, and when you're freshman year, they gave you 25% of your tuition scholarship. Sophomore year, 50%. Junior year, 75%. Your senior year, if you were going into the ministry, it would, they'd cover your whole tuition. As long as you always had to have a ministry at the church. So there was no real ministry at the church. Uh, I started in, my spring, in the spring semester. And uh, so I, I went to the pastor. I said, I got to have a ministry, you know. And he said, well, why don't you go talk to the Sunday school guy? So I went to our Sunday school administrator. And I said, I, I need to have some kind of ministry. And he said, well, I've got, a, I've got a class no one wants to teach. And we had a really nice two-story uh, education building on our church property. And these guys met outside in the portable building. Fourth graders. Evil. Possessed. They were possessed by the spirit of fourth graders. Like I, and uh, oh my goodness. I remember studying so hard for the first Bible teaching. And the, like the first... Some kid raises his hand, I'm talking like five, like ten, like one minute. Like it's right at the beginning. He raises his hand, he's like, why are you all sweaty? Five minutes later, another kid raises his hand, and, and he's like, when are you going to be done? This is boring. And th- it was on. It was like, oh, yeah? Like they were just, they, they'd worked, they, like they, uh, me and my buddy took over the class, and, and they had just worn out these other teachers. And... Uh, you know, here's the point I'm making. You know how old those kids are now? Let's see, I'm 55. At that time, I was, uh, I was 18 years old, and they were 10. So they're eight years younger than me. So how old are those freaky fourth graders? They're geezers now. They're approaching 50. Like they're, what are they, 46, 47 years old? They're in their mid-40s. They, they've already raised their 10-year-olds, and they've been tormented, and God got them all back for everything they did to me, or whatever it is. Like, you think, like, they're, like, whatever, here I was trying to serve the Lord. I remember when it got all done, I was exhausted. And I remember looking at my buddy and just saying, like, what do we sign up for? Like, these kids hate us. They hate the Bible. They hate us. They don't want to be here. I mean, there were some wonderful girls, but the boys were out of their minds. I remember some of their names, and I will not say them. But those kids were crazy. And, and so, but how long did I teach that class? Like, how long really was that? And, you know, really, what was it? Like, it could be drained. You could, you know, they could bring you to the end of your self-esteem. Like, you think, like, I think I should quit. I don't think I need to resign. For, I don't, shouldn't go to Bible college. I don't have what it takes. I want to kill now, I don't want to teach. I want to kill these kids. So it's possible that we could be looking at our affliction, and I'm not making light. If you're going through something, please don't misunderstand me. I'm just telling you what Paul said about what you're going through, not what I say about it. If you come and tell me what you're going through, I'm going to go, I'm so sorry you're going through that. I can't believe it. Like, let's pray right now because that's incredibly hard. But let me tell you what Paul said about it, Okay. Paul said, it's just for a second. It's not for very long. It's not going to be forever. And it's light compared to what it's producing. The the far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. So when I get humbled doing ministry, what do I get? What's the result of being humbled? It's a wonderful word. It's called humility. And humility is wonderful when it comes as a result of some humiliating experience because it's usually pretty genuine. Where, you know, it's not fake. When you've been just crushed by something, you don't have false humility. You've got the real kind because someone wants to puff you back up. You're like, hey, get the, get the puffer away from me. Like, don't, get the, don't puff me up with those bellows. And like, I don't want any part of that. It has nothing to do with what happened here. That was the Lord because I already got creamed. I, I had a humiliating, difficult experience. If I had to wait, if I had to labor and wait and labor and wait and pray and wait and labor and wait, and, it, and it's, it's just, even all of our expressions of patience, they're momentary. They're not, none of us are going to live to be more than 100 years old. 
probably, 105 maybe, 110 if some of you guys are super, I mean, maybe someone makes 111, I don't know. That's not really that long. Not really very long. What, if, you, if you're exercising, if you're, if, you're, if you're having a weight and it's frustrating and discouraging and you're going through that, what's the thing that it produces? It's something amazing called patience. And James says, let patience have its perfect work that you would be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So when you're serving the Lord and it's not going well and you labor and you pray and you labor and you pray and you're faithful and you pray and you labor and you keep doing the right thing, keep doing what God told you and you don't give up and you keep doing it and it doesn't seem like it's working and it seems like you're doing, like you're, it's getting worse or more drama, it's so difficult, but you're sure it's the Lord, it's in the word, God told you, you're still going, you're just gonna stay faithful. And what happens after you did it for three years? It's patience, you get patient. Patience is got a weight. It's weighty. You don't. You you can't get these some of these things for for easy. They're not easy. They're weighty. Humility is weighty. If you have any kind of humility in your life, do you want to give it up? No, you don't. Why? Because you know how much it costs to get it. You're like, you know what? I got hammered. You can't have this gem. <laughs> like, no way. I'm not letting this one go. It came. It was too expensive. How about patience? When you ex- when you have some patience, how did you get it? It's like, oh man, probably, the, 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 probably for me personally, the most humble person I ever knew or was around, the person who was the most patient and the most gracious was Chuck Smith. But Pastor Chuck came by those traits. They were, there was a, they were weighty because when you hear him tell his testimony, he was, he was so proud and striving and driven and 17 years in the ministry and the, no church he ever had ever grew, really. I remember him telling a story. He was at a church once for two years. The only two additions they had at the church were his two kids that were born while they were at the church. You know, pastoring small churches, they're not growing. Small churches not growing. Small churches not growing. And then all of a sudden, the Jesus movement happens, and they're right in the middle of it, Calvary Chapel, and people want to give Chuck Smith the credit. Chuck Smith has an eternal weight that's glorious. He's got something weighty. Like, you want to give, you want to, Say it's me and put my name in a magazine? That isn't worth this thing. No, give me, like, I'm hanging on to my, this thing was expensive. You can have the magazine, you can have the, this, you can have money, whatever it is. I don't want any of that stuff. You can't buy humility, by the way. You can't go buy it. I mean, I guess you could. You could make a dumb decision and lose all your money and essentially buy it, maybe. I don't know. Uh, you can't buy patience. These are things that they're, they're so valuable so Paul's, Paul's going to be talking about, in chapter 5, he's going to move into you know, the, etern- the ultimate eternity as, you know, when our, our body is, is put away and we're with the Lord in heaven. So he is going to go there. But really, in these verses, his, his first, in this section here, as he's talking about this not losing heart, he's making the comparison from what the difficulties are with what the result is. And so how do we do this? Well, there's a couple of, uh, things that he says that are, that are really important. First in verse 16, about the outward man's perishing, that's the suffering that we're experiencing. We're being, our pride's being crushed, our, our lusts are being kicked around, like all our ambitions are dry. Like the outward man is suffering, but the inward man, and here's, here's the first application point for us, the inward man is being renewed day by day. There's a renewal happening on the inside. The renewal of the inner man. Now, it's interesting about this word renewal, and that is, uh, it, it's the word for new, to make things new, <clears throat> that's used a lot over the New Testament, it's used in secular Greek all over the place, but Paul puts a prefix on it, takes the word for new that's super common, and puts a prefix on it, and there's nowhere that this ever occurs in the New Testament except for one other spot where Paul also said, uses the word it never occurs in secular Greek, and it's not till the Byzantine era that this word appears in, that, in this form, you know, hundreds of years later uh, in Greek. So it's super interesting. It seems like Paul just thought, I want to say renewed, but I want to say it in a way that anybody who reads it has never read it like that because we don't use this word. And he, he puts a prefix on it that could mean a, the, the Greek prepositions that often become a prefix on a word, they usually have to do with a direction. 
And sometimes they can mean more than one, and it's the context that tells you. But it's super interesting, the, the prefix that he puts on is a preposition that means upward. <laughs> so it's, it's renewed, it's, it's, it's to, be, to make new, but he puts on upward on, it, on the front of it. Nowhere else in, in, uh, in ancient secular Greek does this form of the word ever occur. It's interesting. One of, the, one of the commentaries I was reading, some old German guys from like 150 years ago were having, like, writing about the debate about, and what the guy's conclusion was, yes, I do believe, I think Paul invented this word, you know. So uh, it, it's, it's not that he invented the whole word. The word means to make new. It's, an, it's a normal word. But he puts something on it that makes it stick out. And I, and I would just, the reason I wanted to bring that up is not to get into some kind of a discussion on etymology or whatever, but in this context, not lose heart. And so what do we have that's so remarkable that you don't have if you don't have Jesus? It's renewal on the inside, day by day. Renewed day by day. We can be renewed on a daily basis. Remember, the mercy of the Lord's new every morning. Um, God wants to do a work in us. The children of Israel wandering through the wilderness, they're getting manna every single day, day by day. They're getting the nutrition, the food that they need that will sustain them on their journey, and they get it every single day. <clears throat> Paul uses the word also in Colossians chapter 3. It seems to be using it a little differently there. Uh, I'll read it to you just so you can compare them in your own mind, but uh, or for your notes, or look at it later. Colossians 3, 9 to 11, he says, he's talking about the, you know, putting away sin, putting off the old man, putting on the new man. So he says, don't lie to one another. This is Colossians 3, 9 to 11. Don't lie to one another since you've put off the old man with his deeds, and you've put on the new man who's renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there's neither Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. There he seems to be talking about the old life, the new life, but this new renewal that we have when we get made new and we put off the old, Christ is everything. It's Jesus, and it wipes out all the other things that would mark us as different from each other. Not Scythian, not barbarian, not Jew, not Greek, not slave or free. It's Christ, this new image, renewed. There's a renewal. It's amazing. The inner man renewed day by day. I can be made new. And let me say, if you want to have stamina, if you want to be able to stick to what God's called you to do and you're in the midst of difficulty and you've put your hand to the plow and you're plowing and you found out that the field the Lord gave you is a parking lot made of concrete, three feet thick, and your plow is just going, <laughs> it's just scratching. And you think, Lord, isn't there a field with dirt in it that I can plow, you know? Uh, or you're plowing along going, this is great. And then you realize it's a field full of boulders. And you plow for a few feet of dirt and then wham, you hit a boulder. And you get the boulder out and you plow another two feet and you get another boulder. And, and that's your whole field. The, the way to not lose heart is to be renewed day by day. Re be renewed day by day. And I'm assuming you know how to do that. How, do we, how are we renewed day by day? Well, it reminds me of God's word to Joshua when, when God was calling him to take over from, from Moses. And God told him, this book of the law will, should not depart from your mouth, but you should meditate on it day and night. And you'll be able to observe to do according to all that's written. And then you'll make your way prosperous and then you'll have good success. He had said to him earlier in chapter 1 of Joshua as I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. A relationship with God personally and listening to God's word daily, day and night. If you have a personal relationship with God where he's revealing himself to you and he's with you and you have his word and day and night you're meditating on his word, then you're going to be made new. You're going to run out of energy and then you're going to get new energy. And it's going to need to happen on a very regular basis. So if, if you're seeking to serve the Lord and you feel tired all the time or you're seeking to serve the Lord and you feel like, man, I thought it would be easier if I was serving the Lord. It seems like every day I need to be renewed. It seems like I get through half of the day and I'm already out of all my energy and I need to be renewed. There's nothing wrong with you. That's normal. 
That's what it's supposed to be like. You come to the end of yourself. You feel like, man, I feel like I'm the worst person that should be doing this. I'm, I'm out of gas. I'm out of energy. I don't have enthusiasm. I don't have ideas. I don't even have any love anymore. And it's 845 in the morning. Like, how do I, like, what do I do? You need to be renewed. Day by day, you need, you need fresh energy. And we know how to do that. You have to, you have to focus on the Lord. In fact, Paul's going to tell us some kind of helpful hints in verse 18. He tells us what not to look at, and he tells us what to look at. And, and I'd really rather focus on what we should be looking on. I'm, again, I'm assuming you're going to be able to put this into, you know, you make your own application out of this. But verse 18, he says, we are not looking at the things which are seen. So we're not going to focus on those things that we can see, the things that are obvious. So if I start teaching a Sunday school class, let's say I talk to Darren, I go, hey, I want to volunteer for Sunday school class. And he says, well, we got a fourth and fifth grade class, you know. And I said, not them again, you know. Oh, Darren, not them. And he's like, yeah, them. That's the only opening. If you want to help out, that's where you can be. And I, and I pray and I say, Lord. And the Lord says, yeah, I, you know, you need to get victory over your flesh. You know, so you, you, I want you in there and, and I'm going to use you. So, so I get excited. And then, and then all of a sudden, I'm like the Billy Graham of fourth and fifth graders. And these kids, like all of a sudden, there's more kids. The fourth and fifth graders have to move in here, and we move the main service into the classroom. Because there's like three or four hundred fourth and fifth graders coming to my class. And then pretty soon, all the fourth and fifth graders in all of Sacramento County are at our church. And so we, we you know, the, the adults, we move them to another building. And the whole building is fourth and fifth graders. And then I start writing curriculum. And then I write a book. And then everybody wants to have me speak at a conference. And what's happening to me? I'm being used by the Lord. But what's happening to me? You see, they're serving the Lord, serving the Lord, your flesh can be really interested in serving the Lord. Um, I, I, always, I do this joke about homeschool kids, so please forgive me if, if you're a homeschool kid and you said this. I, I'm not thinking of you. I'm thinking of kids that I never went to our church. But um, I, I always make this joke about, to my kids about homeschool kids because I've met so many kids when you're with them or the parents are there, you're at some convention or some debate tournament or whatever, and they've got the little kid, and they're like, I'd always ask the kids, like, well, what grade are you in? And you'd hear this a lot. You'd hear, I'm in fourth grade, but I do eighth grade math. So that was my joke. I always tell the kids, you, you know, you're a, you're a freshman in college, but you're doing senior level math or whatever, you know. You're, you're in second grade, but you do sixth grade math. Or the mom. This is little Johnny. Say hello, Johnny, in French. How about now in Spanish? How about German? Like, oh my gosh. Poor Johnny. You know, it's like a little league parent, right? Like, this is my son. He can throw a curveball. He's already had two surgeries on his elbow, and he's 10, but he can throw a curveball. At least, you know, we're trying to teach him with the other arm now. When someone's trying to live through, you know, get something for, you know, that focusing on those things, right? Like, we don't look at the things that are seen, but we do, don't we? So we have to make a choice. We're not looking at the things that our flesh is going to want to look at of why we'll keep going. Why does Mark Zuckerberg keep going? I'm going to tell you, it's not the Lord. He's driven. Why'd Bill Gates keep going? Why'd Steve Jobs keep going? What, dry, what drove Andrew Carnegie? What, what drives a person? Why do you keep going? Well, we're not, gonna, we're not doing it by the things that are seen. Instead, we're looking at the things that are not seen. What are the things that are not seen? The invisible things, the things that can't be seen. We're looking for something else. We're waiting for it. Romans 8, 24 and 25 Paul said, we're saved in hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. Why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we don't see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. That's interesting. We're eagerly waiting for something with perseverance. We're not going to give up. We don't lose heart. We're looking for something. We're hoping for something. Well, what is it we're hoping for? We're not hoping for more money or more status or those things that can be seen. 
Why would I want to spend my energy on that junk? It's all going to burn. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it's all passing away, right? That's what John said, 1 John. Hebrews chapter 11, this is uh, Moses' verse. Hebrews eleven twenty five 25 through 27. It says, Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. He esteemed the reproach of Christ as greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. And by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. You've got Pharaoh, the king of at Moses, in Moses' day, the most powerful kingdom on the earth. And you've got the king of the most powerful kingdom on the earth who has declared war on you. And, and Moses endures by looking for the things that you know, Egypt could never produce. Egypt had gold. It had buildings. Andrew's trying to figure out when, when and what makes that happen. But did you see it? No? Did it wake you up? Sorry. I can't see him back. I can't see you at all, so I don't know. We were, we were just talking about that. It's been, the whole thing just cuts out. It's done that. It's like a new thing. It must be the Egyptian. I was talking about Egypt, huh? It's like, this is Seinhauser. Is that Egyptian? Sennheiser? Sennheiser? So Moses was able to survive because he was able to see the invisible. He chose to reject Egypt. He had the wealth of Egypt. He had the position in Egypt as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was raised up in all the training of the Egyptians. He had a whole life set for him there. And he made a decision. You know what? The reproach of Christ, the choosing to be with the people of God and the plan of God, there's something weighty there and I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And Egypt has nothing that I want. I would trade, up, trade everything here to get this. Right after that, you know, in chapter 12, then the writer makes application of all those stories in chapter 11 and tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, looking unto Jesus. So this principle of seeing the things that are not seen, looking to them, it's not a cliche for us. Go back to 2 Corinthians in chapter 5 when he talks about, he, he moves right into the resurrection, the hope of the resurrection, but, but his conclusion of this whole statement of, of looking at the things that are not seen, having perseverance, being able to hang in there, knowing that even if our body perishes, we're with the Lord. But look at chapter 5, verse 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. Now, that's, that's so profound, but it could sound like a cliche. Well, we walk by faith, not by sight. You know, we should never let that become a cliche. Like, that is actually genius. <laughs> now, if you're walking in this world, and, and you're walking, and it's completely natural, you want to be able to see, because that's our main faculty for navigating, right? If we lost our sight, we would have to develop all, you know, new ways of figuring out, well, how am I going to not trip on something? But, but the faculty of sight is not the faculty we use when we're walking with the Lord. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. So now what guides my uh, decision making and my journey is what? It's what, what has God said? What are the promises of God? What's the heart of God? What are God's values? Does God value children? I've used, I'm teasing about fourth graders. I loved those fourth graders. We made him a little fabulous fourth grader newsletter every week. Gina helped in our class for a while. It got way better when she was helping. The class, the kids grew, some of them, a little bit, perhaps. I mean, hopefully, maybe they didn't, but it seemed like they did a little bit. We're walking by faith, not by sight. What does it mean to walk by faith? It means we're putting our confidence in God's word so every promise, we're going to believe it. And every command, we're going to try to follow it. And when we fail, we're going to get up and go, well, I totally messed that one up. And we're going to keep going. We're going to walk by faith, not by sight. Walking by sight is, well, this isn't working. We don't have enough money. There's not enough people. It didn't really turn into what I wanted it to turn into. Now, I'm not saying God doesn't have you start something. Please don't misunderstand. 
I'm not saying God doesn't ever have, have something start and then it runs for a season and then it stops. Like, we have to be able to look and say, where God guides, God provides. God doesn't seem to be guiding. He's redirecting us. We're going to do something else. We recognize that, but we're not talking about that. Paul's not talking about that. He's talking about when you lose enthusiasm for something that you know you're supposed to be doing, but you just don't have the energy to keep doing it anymore. The way to keep going is to walk by faith, which is to not look at the things that are seen, but to look at the things that are not seen. So how do we learn about the things that are not seen? Well, we're going to only learn about them from the Bible. The love of God, the favor of God, the grace of God, the peace of God, the, the renovation of our inner man, strength and power from the Holy Spirit, that's an unseen thing. The righteousness and the plan of God, the righteousness of God revealed to us. God's um, glory in heaven, the, the goodness of God, the definition of glory, what real glory is. I just saw a thing, you know, with the, with the pandemic, it's created so much difficulty for so many different industries, but one of them is the entertainment industry, specifically sports. So you have a, you have a Super Bowl, but no one can go there, right? Like, and I guess there's a kind of a, some drama with the NBA because it's the all-star game. And a lot of the players are like, why are we playing the game? You know, it's just about money. It's like, why are you playing the game? Isn't it just about money? Like, you aren't playing, you aren't playing for free, dude. You can pay like $20 million. You're like, so, so like, well, we're going to have an all-star game in Atlanta. And the mayor of Atlanta said no one can come. You, like, we wish we weren't hosting it because we don't want a bunch of people coming here and creating a bunch of drama, you know, a bunch of cases and overflow, overwhelming our hospitals. So, so why, what are you doing and why are you doing it? Well, it's something that's seen. It's for glory. I was the best at taking a leather ball, spherical ball, and, and bouncing on a wooden floor like nobody could do it. Guys would try to get in front of me. I could fake them out. I would go, Whoo. And I, you know, you got to bounce it. You can't move too many steps before you bounce it. And I was best at bouncing the ball. And then whoever could throw the ball in the, in the round rim, I was the best ever at that. It's like, this person led their grandma to the Lord. This girl got saved and she led her dad to the Lord and baptized them. This person kept a marriage together for 50 years. This person... Well, this person was always at church early, making sure everything was ready for everybody else. Glory. It's like, okay, well, this one gets you 20 million. This one gets you an eternal weight of glory. We will be able to, we'll be able to get a victory and not lose heart by not focusing on things that are temporary. So that's one of, the, that's one of your lessons out of the passage is don't focus on the things that are going to pass away, the things that are temporary. So what can you focus on? The things that are not going to pass away. I remember the Lord, I remember going to complain to the, uh, we had a, the guy who was our Christian education minister when my, in, back to my Sunday school story. He was just a wonderful man, very godly and super smart, very administrative kind of a guy and really great Bible teacher. And I remember after like the second week, I went up to him and I go, I think you got the wrong guy in there. These kids hate us. They think what we're doing is boring. They think we're stupid. They complain the whole time, like they're out of control. Like, I know I didn't have a teacher in there for them. I think you should just put them in there with meat, lock the door, you know, and then just come, have the parents come get them at the end. And, he, you know, we were, we were joking a little bit about it, but then he just said, he, he gave me some great advice. He goes, they just need to know that you love them. They need that more than anything else to know that you love them. And I remember, as soon as he said, I thought, that's going to be hard because I don't. I go, but these guys are hard to love. And he said, you know what you should do is you should get, you should make a prayer list with all their names on it and pray for those kids by name every single day. And he said, it's really hard to not love people if you pray for them every day. And I remember thinking, huh, I wonder why I didn't think of that. I'm in Bible college and everything, you know. I never really thought. I was praying, Lord, please make these kids not be brats today. Please make them realize how great the Bible study is that I prepared for them. My prayers were a little goofy. What did they need? They needed, they needed an eternal weight of glory. Right? If I'm looking at the things that are temporary, I'm going to be giving people temporary things, but if 
But if I'm, if I'm wanting to serve the Lord and the things that are most valuable to me are the most valuable things, then I might be able to live in this world in my home and at my work and the people I'm around, and I'll be able to see what's real and what's worth it, and I might be able to have something I could actually give to somebody that I could just give them for free. You know, say, hey, look, this came from the Lord, and it's for you. This is what, this is, this will set us free, not focusing on the temporary, but being able to focus on, on the things that, that are eternal because they're weighty and they're real. And if we can stay, uh, be renewed day by day with the Lord, being with him, hearing from him, and then seeing the most valuable things and investing in those things, um, focused on those things, then we'll be able to overcome. We'll be able to, we'll be able to keep going. And, and uh, what's so encouraging about this letter is it's written to the culture that's the most radical in the first, maybe Rome probably, but right there with Rome, you could interchange Corinth with Rome. It's about as decadent and messed up of a place as possibly you could ever plant a church. And, and Paul's speaking to them such powerful, profound truth and so encouraging. So, Father, help us. Help us to be doers of the word. Help us not to lose heart. I want to pray for uh, all my friends here and those that will be listening later or watching online that you'll help us, Lord, not to lose heart. Help us, God, to focus not on the things that are passing away, but help us focus on the things that are weighty, eternal, that aren't passing away, the most valuable things. Lord, set us free. Help us to realize how important humility is and how important patience is. Help us real, realize how important mercy and grace are that we might be able to grow and be used by you in these last days. So pour out your spirit on us, Lord. Fill us with power. Help us, God, to do your will. And we pray these things all together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, your reading, we got to the end of your reading, so you know where we're headed, but... Uh, it's a little bit less material than what we've been doing. These four chapters are smaller, but think of it as like poetry, right? Poetry is smaller, but every word, every line is so packed. Second Corinthians is packed. Uh, there's a lot in there. So uh, do the reading, enjoy it, and uh, we'll, we're going to zip right through it. We'll be in the next chapters already after, after Sunday, but... but uh, encourage you to read it and take it to heart and let the Lord speak to you. So God bless you. God bless the rest of your week.